right, shalom and welcome everybody. Welcome to the Guitar Rabbi YouTube channel. My name is Christopher Fredrickson, a rabbi of Ed Bena. It is an honor and a pleasure to be with each and every single one of you here today. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about something that has uh, really been on my mind um, a lot this past week. And that is me kind of looking back and analyzing music. Since I was a child, I was born in 1980, all the way up until today, and how popular music has really changed over the duration of the past 40 years. Now, objectively, I could probably say, you know, to for me to really remember it, it might be closer to about 35, 36 years, somewhere around there. Because those are the memories of, um, you know, listening to W-I-N-K, you know, back home in Naples, Florida, and all that stuff. And um, kind of seeing how things have really changed a lot since then. And it really kind of, uh, this kind of goes and documents a little bit of history for people years from now and all that stuff to kind of look back at. And also, you know, be me being... You know, a uh, guy who likes to play guitar, you know, you guys can look at that with a little bit of objectivism and say that my opinions about today's music may be because of the fact that I'm a little bit uh, guitar centric. And I think that's that's fair to say, but also to hear me out at the same time. Now, I've, you know, because of the way the music is um, consumed nowadays and all that stuff through the streaming services such as Apple Music and Spotify and all those things. Uh, also, make sure to go and download my album on those streaming services, by the way. Um, diversification. Go and check that out. But the way that we consume music, you know, it's, it's kind of cool because we can go back and instantly kind of be put into that place. You know, and be able to hear things from the day, you know, the what was what was the top charts the day that I was born? You know, what was what was the number one song? And you kind of look back and say to yourself, even if you're only like 20 years old and say, whoa, things have really changed, especially when it comes to radio. And it's interesting because my mom still listens to top 40 radio. My little sister listens to top 40 radio. And all that stuff. And so whenever I'm hanging out with them, you know, I, I hear the top 40 stuff, you know. And so it, it's it's one of those things that, you know, is very well documented throughout my entire life of what it is, I, you know, that used to be played on these very same radio stations, how the formats have changed over the years. And I find it to be, you know, very interesting. But, you know, without any further ado and any backstory, let's go ahead and jump right on into this. You know, in the 80s, Music was eclectic in some ways, okay? You had adult contemporary radio that was very popular, you know. Um, in the 80s, you know, you had people like um, Paula Abdul, Sheena Easton, uh, the Captain and Tennille. You had, uh, you know, Whitney Houston. And Whitney Houston, you know, uh, her entire... Um, career it got even bigger in the 90s you know she was she was big in the 80s but he but got even bigger during that time and then you had a little bit of r&b influence that was you know kind of fused with rock and pop at the time people like michael jackson prince you know and all that stuff you had you had those and you would hear them on top 40 radio and then you would also have you know the soul influence stuff like billy ocean you know, and all that stuff. You know, there'll be sad songs to make you cry. And then you would have, you know, um, the Yacht Rock as well. You know, you'd have the Kenny Loggins. You would have, you know, um, the Doobie Brothers with Michael McDonald and Michael McDonald by himself. And um, people like Christopher Cross and all that stuff. And, and it was a very interesting time for music because it was pretty eclectic at the time, but not really all that eclectic. 
but also we had some of the best music in my lifetime during that time because when I listen back, one of the things I listen to at work all the time is the Yacht Rock station on the TuneIn radio. You know, we let that stream at work all day long. And um, the thing that I, you know, going to listening to Yacht Rock, the thing that I really notice with that is that you have various influences within there. You have soul music that's a part of it. You have rock music that's a part of it. You have, um, you know, smooth jazz as well that, you know, was a part of Yacht Rock and what was big at that time and all that stuff. And you also find that to kind of be going into the other areas. Now, also, you had electronic music that was made popular by people like Kylie Min uh, Minogue, you know, with the locomotion. You had, you know, those elements being used by rock bands as well, like Van Halen, you know, with Jump and then Why Can't This Be Love and all this other stuff. And you start to see that influence because synthesizers and all that stuff was kind of considered to be a, a, a new tech tech technology and a new instrument you know in a person new piano they could go and play a, a synthesizer and get a totally different sound so you find a lot of that music paul abdul used a lot of synthesizers and all that stuff and you see how that kind of stuff goes and influences greatly the music that we have today as well and i'll get into that and so we had a you know a lot of this eclectic stuff but also if you would go and turn on mtv in the 80s I really didn't start watching MTV till like maybe about 1987, 1988. And I'll tell you the reason why I was watching MTV is like every five minutes, Paul Abdul would be on there. I don't know how many times I would have to hear Opposites Attract or Cold Hearted Slave or, you know, something like that on there. But um, the the Ghostbusters 2 had come out, okay? And so I wanted to, to, to record that Ghostbusters rap, you know, done by Run DMC. You know, I was a big fan of Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2 when that came out. So I was constantly watching MTV at that time. And they had this kind of music that wasn't being played on um, Top 40 Radio. It wasn't being played on 107.9, you know, here in Morganton, North Carolina. It wasn't being played on any of these, these stations. I was like, who's this, this Run DMC they're playing every five minutes? Who's this Bobby Brown that they're playing every five minutes? And all this stuff. I never heard of these guys before. And so, you know, the MTV thing was a little bit different from pop radio at the time. Um, and so, you know, I, I started to realize that rap and things like that were a thing during that time. But it really had not become a part of the mainstream. So because of that, I'm not a fan of rap in all honesty. But the thing is... That, um, you know, th there was a lot of eclectic and, and, and diversity kind of musical taste within pop radio in the, in the 80s. Um, but that part right over there was kind of not quite a part of it yet. And now I didn't even get into rock at that time. My, my parents would always listen to Dan Fogelberg, you know, um, Elton John. My mom liked Billy Joel. My dad could not stand Billy Joel. I was a big Michael Jackson fan, in all honesty. And so, you know, that 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 was the kind of stuff that we would hear often. That's kind of the stuff that we were used to and all that stuff. You know, turning on MTV, there, there, there was some some different kind of stuff. And then, you know, in the rock era as well, I'm a big fan of 80s rock. I love 80s rock, you know. Um you know, all the way from, you know, not, not just Van Halen, but, you know, Poison. I used to like Motley Crue until I saw them live in 1999. You know, bands like uh, the Scorpions, uh, Bad English, um, you know, just too many to list. You know, I, I, I love that stuff. And the thing that we started to see at that point is this fusion of the pop hooks with the rock stuff, but then a lot of compression being used. And sometimes when you have too much compression, there's no dynamics in the sound. You know, I listened to a lot of, um, you know, 80s uh, Christian bands at the time. You know, some of the Petra albums, had, I love Petra, great hooks, great singing, great guitar playing, amazing stuff. But sometimes a little bit too much compression. 
Same is true with striper. It's like it's like oh, what's the maximum amount of of, of uh, compression we can use? Okay, we'll double that. You know, it's kind of the way that that was with with striper, and there was there were there were no d- dynamics. Now, some of these producers would go and use um, you know, that like did like poison and stuff like that. You know, you start to see on albums like Flesh and Blood and all that stuff. You would find some songs were overly compressed. Some had those amazing dynamics, you know, like something to believe in had some incredible dynamics. Every Rose Has a Storm, incredible dynamics. Um, Stand, incredible dynamics and all that stuff. And those right there, I really think that 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 kind of production and all that stuff, having those dynamics really um, caused in many ways, the songs to be able to be fused, their accompaniment to be fused with the vocals to where you're given feeling over that whole thing because you're hearing the dynamics, not just in the vocal range, but also in the loudness of certain parts. Certain parts were softer, certain parts were laughter, were, were louder. And it's so interesting because we constantly use fade outs and all that stuff um, in music that is produced by everyone and everyone today. You know, so, you know, the, di- the what's, what's the reason in which it is you're doing that? Well, you, you got dynamics there. And then things started to change a little bit in the 80s. You know, 80, 91, 1990, 91, 92, it was kind of, kind of the same thing. For the rock world, things started to change a little bit. Um, you had, uh, you know, the, the grunge era came about. Now, 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 I see the grunge era much differently than... You see, reported by you know these twenty-year-olds that uh, that write for Rolling Stone magazine and some of these others, because I didn't hear about Nirvana until 1994. I think was the first that I heard about Nirvana, and I think just a couple of months later is when I found out that uh, Kurt Cobain had died. I didn't know anything about Nirvana, you know, so. A lot of the times you see these uh, things uh, say that, you know, oh, yeah, you know, Nirvana took the world by storm whenever they released um, um, uh, Smells Like Teen teen Spirit and all that. My introduction to Nirvana was Heart Shaped Box, in all honesty. And, And I'll tell you, you know, being a person who was, you know, hanging out with, you know, who was that age, you know, that all these papers and uh, all these publications say oh yeah you know all the young people are all into nirvana at that time i had out of like 30 friends i had like one that listened to nirvana and that uh, i heard about nirvana because of this one person nirvana wasn't really that popular of a band for my age group in middle school at that time they really weren't um by by some they 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 were and we started to see the bands that my friends in high school and stuff like that started to listen to they were definitely influenced by Nirvana and all that stuff but I I, I think that the history is a little bit revisionist in many ways of how it is that people say oh yeah you know they they just kind of took the world by storm it really didn't operate that way in all honesty but the the music scene in terms of rock really did change. At that time, you know, because you got less of that compression, less of that things being polished, uh, less of those of those hooks that would get you singing, singing along. And I got to be totally honest with you. There's some of the grunge stuff that I like. um, But after I hear it, I'm, you know, if say, for instance, you know, I like the song by Pearl Jam Better Man. But after I hear it once every five years or so, it's like, okay, I got my fill of that. You know, and that's kind of the way that I personally operate. <laughs> In fact, the first uh, grunge album that I got was Vitology by Pearl Jam because, there, you know, I, I remember seeing ads for Pearl Jam on TV. You know, some of the TV shows I would, I would watch, they had mentioned Pearl Jam. And it's like, okay, well, all the cool people are listening to this Pearl Jam. And I got Vitology and it's like, okay, I really don't get it. <laughs> I really... Honestly, don't get it. This this sounds just weird to me. Uh, but I was starting to get into rock, and uh, this is when I discovered Van Halen. You know, um, 
through the uh, old uh, Crystal Clear Pepsi commercial right now. And I was like, what is that song? That is such a cool song. You know, the song right now. And um, so, you know, at that time, you know, it wasn't like today's time. You'd have to get the either the tape or the CD or, you know, maybe if you still had a record player, you get the record. You get the record. We never called it vinyl, by the way. Everybody today, you know, you always know that they didn't live 40 years ago if they call it vinyl. We called it records or LPs is what we called it during during that time. We never called it vinyl. Uh, <laughs> vinyl was something that you would put on your car and all that stuff. If you needed like a little swoosh on there or something like that. But, um, you know, so I, you know, I was like, well, what albums is, 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 is this on? And you'd, you know, go into the record store, you have to check the track list and goes on that one. Maybe it's on this one and all that stuff. The internet wasn't a thing really to the extent that it is today at that time. It was kind of, you know, you might have like one out of a hundred people in your town use the internet, you know, mainly for email and all that stuff. But I don't even know if you could even look that stuff up at that time around uh, 1993, 1994, or somewhere around there. And so I ended up getting the um, uh, uh, Live Right Here, Right Now, which is still probably one of my favorite Van Halen albums because it introduced me to the entirety of Van Halen's catalog or a, or a huge majority of it. And um, so I ended up getting that, and then... I found out that they had this new album that had come, come out a little bit later called Balance. And it's interesting because Balance is a lot different from the rest of the Van Halen stuff, especially the stuff with Sammy Hagar. And so I knew that there was a change in something at that time. Now, other stuff I was listening to at that time, Meat Loaf's Bad Out of Hell 2 was one of my favorites. I was also listening to Ace of Bass. I was listening to Mariah Carey and all that stuff because at that time I thought she was just absolutely adorable. You know, this is, you know, around 1993, 1994, 1995, okay? So we're not talking about after that, okay? And so I had uh, all, all those CDs, and I was also getting into this new dance music that they had at the time, you know, Too Unlimited, you know, you guys remember that. Y'all ready for this? Do 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 do. Uh, who else was during that time? Um, W was another one. Uh, oh gosh, I can't even. Uh, the M people and all that stuff. That that was some really cool stuff, and it was different from the '80s, but it was more produced. Real Real McCoy was another one of my favorites. You know, uh, great 90s dance music, real, real, real McCoy. And there was one station, I think it was 95.1 in this area, that was playing mainly that stuff. And then they would throw in some rap as well. And I was like, eh, no, nope, I, could, I, could, I, could, I could do without that. But they were doing the 90s dance. And, and the 90s dance stuff was, you know, big in some in, in some parts of society at that time around you know 1992 to uh, about 1996 i think aqua kind of killed it with the barbie girl thing in all honesty but i actually like that album by aqua i actually you know i gotta give aqua props but you kind of listen to that stuff you see where music has gone today and how it got there was from that kind of stuff. Now we also still had adult contemporary, and the cool thing is, in the late the late eighties is when adult contemporary started to change a little bit. Okay, one of the things that you will find from adult contemporary music from around the time of like nineteen eighty nine, all the way till like nineteen ninety seven, nineteen ninety eight is you will find that it follows this pattern of how it is that there is a marriage between the lyrics, the way the song is sung, as well as the music that accompanies it. There was dynamics and emotion that were married together. I mean, it was almost like listening to an orchestra how well it was put together. And a lot of times they would end up using an orchestra in all honesty. But there was, you know, when you would hear a song about, 
you know, somebody's, you know, love for their girlfriend or the wife and all this, if you really felt that, you know, in those songs, because all of those things just married together. And that, in all honesty, that time period, I think for adult contemporary and pop music was the best produced music that we have had in history. You know, because you go and you listen to, you know, for instance, uh, Mariah Carey, you know, you listen to Emotion or Make It Happen. You know, you listen to those, you listen to uh, a, any of Celine Dion's hits from that time, Power of Love and all that stuff. You You feel that even with some of the live performances by like Rod Stewart, you know, uh, uh, a reason to believe you listen to the unplugged version of reason to believe or Eric Clapton's tears in heaven that was made popular by the unplugged series that all came out around that time. And then you also have Clapton's song that he did with Babyface as well. Change the world that he did for the phenomenon sound soundtrack. It's like you feel that stuff. You absolutely feel it. And that, those were the most top-notch musicians that were accompanying these singers at the time, you know, and you even had that as well, even in other forms of music, Christian music, for instance, Michael W. Smith, the song place in this world or here for you, or Stephen Curtis, Curtis Chapman. Um, I will be here. You know, you, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, it, it is, it, it is the pinnacle of pop music, in my opinion, at that time. 1993 for pop music, things started to get a little bit different in some areas of it. You know, you still had your Mariah Carey's and all that stuff, and they were still popular. You still had your Whitney Houston's. Whitney Houston was killing it with the bodyguard theme and all that stuff. You know, I mean, you still had all of those, but then you had this other element that came in as well. You had the Lisa Loeb's, you know, you got this, you got this uh, 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 nerdy looking girl, which is not something that you totally see. And I always thought that she was just absolutely adorable, by the way. I always had a crush on Lisa Loeb, uh, you know, and uh, playing an acoustic guitar, just her and an acoustic guitar singing this song, you know, that kind of still had those poppy hooks and all that stuff. You started to see a little bit of that thing. You started to get things like toad in the wet sprocket that started to make their way into pop music. You know, um, you started to get other things as well that there was like the music scene's changing, you know, the Rembrandts, their uh, theme to the friends um, TV show was something that was played every five minutes. You uh, got married to the Brooks with a, a song that I'm not going to mention the title of. You guys probably know uh, many people, you know, on like LimeWire and Napster would label it Cheryl Crow. It wasn't Cheryl Crow. But then you got the Cheryl Crows. You ended up getting the Counting Crows. You ended up getting all these other things. And you started to see it change a little bit. And those things, you started to see um, some of that grunge influence in many ways. And, we're, and we'll are and get to grunge during that time as well. That... It wasn't as pop polished. So it was very odd to, you know, turn on top 40 radio and you would hear, you know, Lisa Loeb with you say, I only hear what I want to. And then you have this, this amazing ballad with an orchestra behind it by Celine Dion. <laughs> you know, it's like there, there was this contract, the, the, this kind of contrasting thing that was in the top 40. And then I, I I started to see that you know that this um, stuff that was kind of um, um, R and B based rap kind of stuff started to make its way into the charts. I remember um, the first time I, I I looked at the the, the charts and this guy Montel Jordan, you know was 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 number one had been number one for like you know six weeks or something like that. But this is how we do it, you know. And I was like. Uh, I, I don't understand this. Where, where did where did this come from? You know, I did not see this coming and all that stuff, you know? And so that started to happen and top 40 radio, you know, still, you know, it, it was interesting because top 40 radio was still pretty much the same that it was, except for 
a change in an element here. Like, you know, here's some toad in the wet sprocket. Here's the gem blossoms. You know, here's, um, you know, the spin doctors, you know, with two princes and all that stuff. That song got played every five minutes and people seem to have forgotten that song. I love that song, by the way. Um, I love the, 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 the spin doctors. But, uh, you know, the, the music scene started to really change at that time. And then, of course, I was always looking for the next Michael Jackson album. And then History was, was released. You had this thing that was really um, heavily modern R&B-inspired and rap-inspired album on disc, on disc 2 that had all the new stuff. You know, the first disc was all the greatest hits. And then this sounded a lot different from Dangerous. This sounded a lot different from Bad. This sounded a lot different from Thriller. And um, it's one of those things that I had to listen to a few times to grow to like it, in all honesty, because I remember when they released the, the song Scream with Michael and Janet, you know, and all this stuff. I was like, I'm not sure if I like this or not. And it's kind of one of those things that I had to kind of grow grow into it. And then we started to see the rock scene. You know, rock radio was still a thing. You know, uh, the local rock station here was 95.1. And it was such a cool station at that time because you would you would hear stuff from the 80s. You would hear stuff from the 70s. You would hear stuff from the 60s. And then they'll be like, here's the new single from Bush. You know, here's the new single from Rob Zombie. Here's the new thing from Nine Inch Nails. You know, all of that stuff from the past 40 years or 30 years, rather, would be like, you know, let's m mesh it all up. You know, let's play all of it. And that's what they did at that time. Now it's like, you know, 90, 95.7 is all, you know, the, the edge. Uh, I think it's, no, the ride is the ride now. That's right. 95.7, the ride. Um, it's all 1970s. That's all it is now. And it's like any, anything past the 1970s, they don't they don't play. But rock radio was really neat at that time because you had stations like 95.7 that did that. Then you had 93.3 as well that had, you know, the new stuff. And then you had 106.9, The Edge, you know, that had nothing but the newest stuff, you know. Every five minutes, they would play that new Alanis Morris say, yeah, 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 I don't know. You know, they would have to play that every five minutes on there. And it, it, it was interesting because, you know, I was listening to rock radio because, you know, I was listening to Van Halen at that time. And that's kind of what I was expecting. But I see that the rock scene had really changed. And then you started to see those that were in the rock sector kind of move on over into the pop thing. You know, I never thought in in my life that the you know the first station I mentioned here in North Carolina 107.9 would have been playing Alanis Morissette. But you know, as soon as you know every single after you ought to know they played nonstop on that station. Then they started to play REM. I mean I, I was like they 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 decided to go alternative at that time and they were playing uh what what's the frequency Kenneth? you know, every other song, you know, at that time. And it was really weird because it's like, this isn't what I remember if of top 40 radio and top 40 was really changing a lot. You were starting to get more of that rap influence in there. You were starting to get more of that rock influence in there. And then you were starting to also get, you know, the, the adult contemporary and all these things were kind of working together at that time. It was, you know, the, the, the mid-90s was amazing time for music as well. Just an incredible thing because the top 40, there was so much stuff in there. In fact, I could have sworn that one time I turned on, you know, top 40 radio and I heard Johnny Lang, blues musician, Johnny Lang, his song Lie to Me, you know, playing on there. And so that was that was really, really neat. That was a really cool time for radio at that time in top 40 radio and that progression continued on all the way throughout the nineties. Um, rock music started to change. You started to get the new metal and you started to get this more, um, stuff mixed in that they call industrial that is mixed in with techno elements and all that stuff. In fact, there's a 
wonderful Guns N' Roses um, tribute album called Appetite for Reconstruction. It should be on most of your streaming services, but it's like, um, you know, you cover versions of the Appetite for Destruction album, but done with, um, you know, some real punch from an industrial side of things. And that's some, that's some really cool stuff that I, I really think could have gone a lot further, but didn't. But you started to get those elements when Kid Rock put out his first album. You started to see that with Rob Zombie's first solo album. And I think you kind of, you know, you got the Marilyn Mansons and the Corns and all that stuff that kind of influenced that. And my friends in, in high school, they were listening to Garbage. They were listening to Corn. They were listening to Rob Zombie, of course. They were listening to, um, there was a band that, you know, everybody thought was going to be really big and they never were, in all honesty. Um, but uh, it, we, we were probably fans because of the fact of, we graduated from high school in 1999, and the name of the band was Class in 1999. And our, our the senior song that year was actually uh, Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 by Class of 1999 um, uh, that was from the faculty soundtrack. And so we started to see, to see that, and then I go off to, to college in 1999 over at Bavard College, and... Limp Biscuit started to become a thing. You know, that was what everybody was was listening to. And now at the time, there was this thing called Much Music that was on direct TV at the time. And I was would always watch Much Music because I really didn't care for the stuff that was on MTV at that at that point. So, you know, I'd go and turn on Much Music. And, you know, you started to see, you know, they started to do it like a bunch of the boy band stuff on there a lot of rock stuff and then some more of that um that uh, 90s dance stuff you started to see a lot of that on there but i started to notice that that really wasn't what my friends were listening to my friends were listening to everclear because uh you know that song if you don't know what it's like sing the blues you know uh santana of course and i and i could get around that because you know i remember santana from all the the, the guitar albums that I had bought and all that stuff. You know, I remember Black Magic Woman. It was like, oh, Smooth came out. He's still around. That's awesome. Um, Three Doors Down was uh, something else that my friends were listening to and all that stuff. And then a lot of my friends were also listening to, uh, to rap music. My buddy James, you won't believe how many times I would hear him screaming DMX. I didn't have any clue of who DMX was, you know, but he was a couple of doors down from me in the dorms. And I would constantly be hearing that. And you really started to see rap. And uh, I, I think they also call it hip hop, you know, uh, go and influence rock. And you have that with the new metal, with the Limp Biscuits, and, uh, you know, and, and, and all those things. You start to really see that kind of come about. And you then you start to see that stuff as well within Top 40 Radio. And this takes us into the 2000s. Because it's interesting because I remember in 2001, the Black Eyed Peas had just come out and they were, um, you know, uh, a rap group, you know, with some other elements and all that stuff. But they didn't have a lot of those other elements. And their first song, first hit single was uh, Where Is The Love? That was being played on Top 40 Radio. You know, so you had this rap song um, on Top 40 Radio. And then you would have at the same time, with that, you would have B.B. Um, Mac come on right after them. Any of you remember B.B. Mac? Until you're back here, baby. And then you'd have NSYNC, the Backstreet Boys, all that stuff. And then, oh, here's the newest single from Celine Dion. And then they would have uh, the Destiny's Child and all that stuff. You know, so you start to see a lot more of the R&B influence into the 2000s. Uh, Beyonce started to become a thing because of Destiny's Child and all that stuff. Um, but then, as well, you had these groups like Crazy Town. You know, Crazy Town you know, had the rap and the rock thing going. You know, they play Butterfly, you know, so very often on there, on Top 40 Radio. Butterfly was on all the time. But then you would hear um, The Offspring as well on Top 40 Radio. Now, this adult contemporary stuff that, you know, that they had... 
you know, kind of died after uh, Donna Lewis had uh, uh, her big hit, you know, that kind of died at that time. It's like, you know, Richard Marks, gone. Brian Adams, gone, you know, and all that stuff. As soon as like 2000 or probably about 1999 or 98, somewhere around there, it's like a flip, a whole thing was done. It's like, okay, adult contemporary no more. We don't want that on top of 40 radio anymore. So they didn't do that. Now this becomes the most diverse time on top 40 radio, I think. Even though it is that you got, you know, the top 40 or the not top 40, but the adult, adult contemporary gone, you had all these other elements that they were putting into radio. Um, so you know, all the people that I that that, that I that I mentioned, you got the rappers on the, you got you know the rock guys on top 40 radio and all that stuff. And uh, still, you know, not the greatest rock stuff, but, you know, at, at least rock is being rep represented. You know, you had Kid Rock on there that did a little bit of both. You had Limp Bizkit out there that was doing a little bit of both. And, um, you know, in terms of adult contemporary, it kind of got, you know, switched with the uh, this new style of, of R&B. You know, from things like Destiny's Child and so on and so forth. And uh, the, the band Bewitched. You guys remember Bewitched, you know, and all that stuff. You know, I'm, I'm probably naming off a bunch of things that you guys have probably totally forgotten forgotten about. Um, but, uh, you know, this is what was constantly be, being, being, being played. And then Nickelback became a thing. Creed became very popular. And then also in the late nineties and early two thousands, there was this band out of Australia that was just huge. And if a person didn't say that they liked them, they secretly liked them. Okay. Now I was one who openly liked them and that was Savage Garden. It's like Savage Garden. Everybody loved that. Why? Probably because of the fact that adult contemporary radio was kind of gone out of the top 40, but it's like, Oh, we'll give you a little something. You know, I knew I loved you before I met you. Um, you know, truly madly, deeply crash and burn, you know, hold me, you know, all those amazing songs by that. And plus there was this fun element of them for, with like the songs, I want you and the songs like, uh, you know, uh, the animal song and, and, and all this stuff. There was that fun dance vibe. With they still had some guitar in it and all that stuff. Half of Savage Garden was a guitarist, you know, and so that was you know that was a really fun time for music, a really fun time in you know around you know and Creed also was was you know a huge hit at the time. Um, you had a lot of rock bands that were still kind of killing it during during that time and that went on for a couple of years and then you started to see well radio we're gonna have a token rock song we're gonna have a token rock band you know and it might be somebody like uh blink 182 might be somebody like green day it might be you know basically everybody who sounded exactly like each other essentially but then you had in like 19 or 2006 you had this throwback band the darkness that was you know getting a lot of attention and it was interesting because i was like that sounds really 80s that sounds like the the 80s rock that i that i used to listen to and people started to realize that there was still a market for that and then they forgot <laughs> all over but then around that same time around uh 2006 around that time you started to really hear pop music really take this route of like this is all the pop music's going to be and you guys know the sound you know i remember my brother was big into um top 40 radio and so i would go in you know cd burners were a, a big thing at that time and my laptop had a cd burner in it and so i would go and you know use the torrent software and i would go and get the top 40 for that week and i'd do something nice for my brother and go and burn it onto a, a cd for him and all that stuff it's like oh here's the most popular stuff that you've, that you've been listening to and i you know considering that at that time 
going and downloading something was an investment in many ways, you know, because it took so long to do. Um, I would be sitting over there. And plus, you know, hard drive space was very limited. And it still is to some extent. But I would go and look at the titles of these songs and, and these artists. And it's like, I don't recognize any of these. I don't recognize any of these people. And it was all had that. It, it was all like, you know, this change in, in R&B. It wasn't the R&B that I remember. It wasn't like, you know, uh, Billy Ocean. It wasn't like... Uh, uh, Quincy Jones, it wasn't like The Temptations, it wasn't like Lionel Richie, it wasn't like, you know, uh, any of that stuff. It was, and you guys know it, you guys know it, you guys have heard it, you know, the women all have to do this. It's like, what the heck is that? What the heck is that? And then everybody had to sound like either they had a speech impediment you know all you know everybody had to sound had to sing like they had a speech impediment and then if you had like real instruments it would usually only be a piano okay and you had to sound so depressed okay you you know it's it's like oh you got a depressing song just you and a piano that's all that the piano is used for, which, you know, used to not be the thing. And you started to notice at that time that, you know, real drums were switched out for computers. You started to see that a lot of the instrumentation was switched out for computers. And we started to see the, you know, the, 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 the you know, synthesized technology being used in the 80s with people like, Paula Abdul, Madonna, you know, a little bit with Michael Jackson and all that stuff. But all that was part of an accompanying accompaniment with the music. Now, at this at this point, you had, you know, in the early 2000s, you had, you know, people like Tommy Lee say, saying, oh, yeah, I produced all this music on my computer, you know, with the first Methods of Mayhem album. Um, and so... You know, people started to see the computer as being an instrument, you know, that you don't need to learn guitar. You don't need to learn bass. You don't need to learn, you know, a, a real piano or any of that stuff. You've got a computer, you know, just go and punch in some things, do a little algorithm and all that stuff. And, and it's interesting because it makes sense that music would go in that direction because at that time, you know, around 2006, 2007, especially 2008, everybody was, you know, starting to have conversations, not with each other, sitting across from each other. They're like, oh, I got to text this person, you know, and all that stuff. It was like the cell phone was the thing that a person would have to look at every five minutes. Well, now people don't want to put down their cell phone. <laughs> they want to hold it all day long, look at it all day long and all this stuff. And so it makes sense that instead of, you know, learning music, learning how to play music and all that stuff, people would it, at this time instead go and say, well, let me just use my screen to create music and all that stuff. Now, today in pop music, it is pop music is not diverse in any way, shape or form. It's it's not. It's all the same. It's all computerized. It's all auto-tune. It's all created through an algorithm. And it's like, okay, we're going to have the, these rap elements here. We're going to have the person singing with a speech impediment here. If you can get those rappers to have a speech impediment as well, you got a huge hit on your hands. And also, if you can get the F word in there, 20 times into a song, it's destined to go to number one. You think I'm joking on that? Go to your favorite streaming service and go and look at the top 100. The thing that you'll notice, the top 100 songs, probably about 90 out of 100 will have the explicit lyric thing in there. Um, it'll have that. And so... 
honestly, music used to be this thing that really took an immense amount of talent. You know, hours after school with your instrument. You know, the vocal range, it's it's so incredible when you hear the vocal range of a early 90s Mariah Carey or a Michael Bolton, you know, during that time or a Whitney Houston, you would hear them go really high. You'd hear them be able to come down really low. You'd be able to hear them be able to sing softly and then loud and all this stuff. I mean, incredible singers. Some of the greatest of all time. But today, it's like, how many times can you... And that's supposedly a great singer today. Oh, you you were way out of tune, but don't worry. We'll, we will fix that with the autotune. We'll get that in post. And that's what pop music is today. It's It's computer music. It's essentially computer music. And it is probably the least diverse time for music in terms of the top 40. It really is. Can this change? Some people have said, you know, I think because of things like YouTube, things like uh, the streaming services and all that other stuff, I think that there is a change, you know, happening. I think I'd see more people getting interested in rock music and all that stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't see that in all honesty. Uh, Andrew says, greetings from the UK. That was everything in your world. Okay. Um, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with the program. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, I think that there are certain individuals that start to see that you have like groups today, like, uh, the 1975, you know, they're adding some good guitar influence in there and all that stuff. You start to see that you're starting to see, you know, this, this one rapper, I forget his name, but he was in the, the Motley Crue movie. And because he played Tommy Lee, he decided to do a rock album. Now the rock album is not really a rock album. In all honesty, but people are starting to look to, to to look back at that. You know, the biggest selling tours right now, Guns N' Roses on the Not in the Lifetime tour. Uh, Motley Crue, even though they're horrible live, absolutely atrocious. Well, let me tell you something. You go to you go to that to to to, to that to that show. You spend the four hundred dollars to go to that show. You will not be a Motley Crue fan by the time you leave. That's what happened to me when I saw them. That's what happened to everybody I know that has seen them. But, uh, you know, but, but, you know, Def Leppard and Poison and Joan Jett will get, get some new fans. So that's, so that's, so that's good. But that's a huge selling tour. You know, the, I think all those dates are sold out. And so I think there's a lot of stuff that is kind of tied to nostalgia in some respect. And I think that that's, um, you know, I think that, that it, it can be objectively said and be said to be objectively true that a lot of it is indeed tied to nostalgia because you know um you start to see the rock music that is being produced today it's nothing like the rock music that was produced then except if it was those members of those bands you know you take for instance some of the guys from trickster are still doing stuff of course sammy hagar is still doing his thing um david lee roth i don't even know what the heck he's doing uh, you know, Poison still doing their thing, Def Leppard still doing their thing, and so on and so forth. You know, um, but you don't hear of the new guy coming out and just wailing and the 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 next new guitar hero, you know, out there. You know, uh, you don't hear of any new Eddie Van Halens, you don't hear of any new uh, uh Paul Gilberts or you know, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy pages or Jimmy Hendrix's and all that stuff. You don't hear of those. Doesn't mean that they're not out there, but if they are, nobody knows about them. That's the state of music today. Um, I think that there is a small window 
that uh, could be walked through to cause music to become a little bit more diverse like it was during the 90s and all the huge major ups and downs. Because in all honesty, music, top 40 music has not changed in 15 years. It's the same thing. But it's so interesting because when you look at the 90s, you see it changed at least three or four different times in the 90s. But in 15 years, you hear a song from 2006 that was number one. It's going to sound exactly the same like a, a the number one song of 2021. And that's sad. That's really sad. Um. So what? So what do I see happening in the future? I can't say that I look into a crystal ball and that I know. Um, I have hope that music will become a little bit more diverse and a little bit less of this, you know, um, computer synthesized garbage that we end up seeing now. Um, I think that basically people have to demand it. I think that, you know, you have to have other types of music to come up through the ranks and, and the streaming services and all that stuff. Can that happen? I don't know. I would think that it can if you have somebody that's pretty incredible in those things that kind of, you know, pushes the door open a little bit more and allows for all these others to come in behind them. I, I, I guess that could happen. Do I see it happening? I don't know. I don't know. We'll have, we'll have to wait and see. Guys, thank you for joining me here today. I want to wish all of you shalom, bracha, peace and a blessing, and uh, have a great rest of your week, all right? Shalom, shalom.